niche that you can make tons of money. Simple dwellings, fix them up, renovate them, and rent it. You can have nice passive income. All right, that's the your idea. Hello, exactly. And keep in mind some location, 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 right? Some neighbors are, you know, something happens in the market, the economy, perhaps that neighborhood, the rents may not be as high as other neighborhoods. So you can, this is one way that you can really balance your portfolio. You're very smart. Excellent. How about you? I honestly don't know. Well, let's say an idea. Uh, would you ever like to purchase, let's say, a house or yeah. a condo? Yeah. Right. So, you know, you can have that mindset, you know? And you don't have to have, you don't have to start with uh, an investment. You can just start with your primary residence, you know? It doesn't have to be an investment. You know? How about you? Okay. How many units? Perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea, right? I mean, remember what Chris says as well? His company manages how many thousands, thousands of units. So it is possible, you know? All these buildings are near Playa Vista, you know? 75 unit building, 100 unit building. Somebody owns that property, right? Perhaps a syndication, perhaps a group of investors, perhaps one investor, you know? That can be. Uh, I'm going to start small. So, beginning investment. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. How about you? Okay. You see, your path that you're talking about is excellent, right? Now you're very focused about that. He started with like one to three units, maybe a duplex, a triplex. Perhaps you can refinance that, pull money out, and purchase your next one, fourplex to 10 units, and then keep going up, right? So if you have that mindset to do, you, you'll accomplish that. It's just a matter of uh, you uh, learning what you're gonna be learning in my class, or you're gonna be learning the real estate certificate program and uh, and apply your skill set. You know? How about you? Residential, single family, yeah. I mean, let me put it this way, right now, when you are at school, yeah, invest is nice, but also you think about where you're gonna live as well, right? So you think about primary residence, a condo, a duplex perhaps, you can buy maybe a triplex where you can live in one unit and the two rents from the other two units can help you with the mortgage. That's, that's an excellent view that you have. How about you in the back? Okay. Like, okay, like condos and townhouse, what about? Um, See, right now you said like uh, your mindset is more about, yeah, you can buy condos and townhouses, but at the same time, you're aware of who is going to be your renter, the demographic, the psychographics, right? That's like special. Um, backgrounds they have, you know, a profession they have, you know, so you are aware of that as well. Excellent. How about you? Uh, I think the ones that have like a mix, multi family houses. Whereabouts? Globally. I mean, they, it's possible. By the way, my background originally from Nicaragua, you know, and I do have family members that they own property in Nicaragua and they own property here, you know. And so that's a strategy as well, you know. You can spend some time here with your investments. You can go back home and spend time, you know, what, whatever country you're from, you know. So it's, it's, it is possible to do it as well, you know. And we'll talk about also about what's eligible for 1031 exchanges, why it was not, you know. There's a fine line that you have to separate between uh, private residence and investment, you know. So perhaps you can purchase a house that's in Spain, South America, you know. Can be an investment, but also you have to make a decision how many days in one year or in a time period you're going to be renting, and also you can allocate some time for yourself. Isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> how about you? Duplex? What about? Yeah. By the way. Question for you just to pick your brain a little bit. Why did you, you said duplex, you didn't say a single dwelling? Why duplex? Why duplex? 
talks about all this stuff. That's how I want to see right now what you said right now. That's the key to success in the beginning. That's that's your baby steps. Let's say if you want to take 1,000 steps to your company ability, your baby steps, your one, two, three, four steps is what you're talking about. You get that duplicate and give me one unit and help yourself out with the next one. You know? How about you in the back? Um, so I actually end up with like my apartment and stuff Start building like really quickly your site, like also commercial. I'm that's why out of my knowledge, so I'm very interested in talking more about that. Yeah, I want to share with you that uh, residential, commercial, and industrial, right? So, right now we're talking about investment property. Commercial, it goes up over five minutes in a vault, you know. When you go to the bank and you're going to apply for a loan, that's how you separate what type of loan you're going to get. You're going to get a commercial loan, it's going to be more than five minutes. So, even though it's like a residential building, that's right. Be a commercial loan. That's correct. Oh, okay. That's exactly right. Excellent observation right there, you know. So, residential, right? Single dwelling, townhouse, one house. So that will be the residential, you know? Commercial, it deals with you know, multifamily. It can be that 100 unit building, or it can be that industrial property as well. So that will be part of the commercial. You know? In your mind, uh, when you talk about residential, what would you like to purchase in residential? So far, I only thought like apartments and then this one single house. So you might have to exchange yeah. things with it's a nice one. Yeah. Versus like a really good school. Yeah. But I, I have to admit, I'm not too uh, clear about my strategy. Yeah. It's like still shaping it. By the way, what uh, maybe we talk about a thousand steps. We talk about five steps that he, he wants to take. You are in the step five to ten already. You're 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 already you're not crawling anymore, you know? You already got the property, and now you have some renters that you're getting income, you know? So basically right now, it's just a matter of if you want to expand your portfolio, perhaps single dwellings, perhaps 20, 30 units, perhaps like fourplex, or, or it can be a triplex, or maybe a 10, 20 unit building, you know? So this class is going to teach you to get to that, to that level, you know? Isn't it great? I know, I, guys, this, I do this on a daily basis for the past 10 plus years. I found this niche in the market, you know? And we're gonna learn today about how do we go about to get our wealth to another level, you know? This class is gonna teach you the fundamental and how you're gonna be structuring those deals. You know? I tell you this, 75% of investors who have, let's say a 10, 20, 30 unit building, but only one building, but they don't have that mindset to take it to the next level, you know? Which is kind of what you're talking about right now, that you have your property, and then you wanna know how to take it to the next level, perhaps more, you know? So you can take the route of refinancing, pull money out, or do what we're talking about right now, 1031 exchange where you're gonna leverage and you are going to increase your cash flow. Uh, welcome, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. Um, we're talking right now about real estate investment, entrepreneurial spirit, financial engineering. Putting all that together because we're all gonna interact today. We're gonna have a, a discussion, you know? And, I, and I'm sharing my personal and professional experience with you guys, my perspective so you can learn as well and ask me questions, you know? What, uh, like right now, what's uh, your experience in real estate? Um, not too much, I'm entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship? I'm doing it more from the investment standpoint. 
being able to just live smarter and be able to, you know, when it comes to buying a home and buying a house, be able to do it smarter and more effectively. Do you have a little finance background? Kind of, not really. But a little bit, right? Bit. And you're learning more. Yes. Do you realize that right now, that, by the way, he just came in, can you just describe those three pillars that we talked about right now? I'm going to go back. He described real estate investments, entrepreneurial spirit, financial engineering. So in less than 60 seconds, you have to speak with all of us. Awesome. Awesome. Very excited. I'm excited too. Let me go back to the slides. So just to uh, wrap it up here as far as my office building. So this is what I did. That 65% of that loan, you can get that money. They put it in your bank account, right? It's up to you to do the business, right? So SBA loans is to open, it's a small business loan, right? So you open your business. So you can go ahead and have a business opportunity, purchase that, perhaps that business that you want to do. So what did I do? Because I wanted to stay focused, you know? I purchased this office building in Torrance. Prime location. When I saw this building and I got my, my broker's license, I didn't care the condition of that property. I didn't care even how much it was. I don't think I even negotiated the price, you know, because I saw my future. I, I saw my future in that building, you know? How many of you guys know where Torrance is? Okay, so you are aware that Torrance is an excellent area, main boulevard, prime location. As soon as I saw that building, I said, you know what? I need to have that property. So that's what I did, you know? So instead of going to purchase a business, I used that money to purchase that property. So that's how I acquired that office building. And I've been there since then. Two hours ago, I was at my office is structured. I know that 1031 exchange with a client. So I love going to work. This is like my second home, by the way. It's, it's exciting. Um, all right, let's continue. Um, if you can, Mo, can you read what it says right here? Yeah, uh, Corporation C uh, uses future commercial real estate business sales transactions as collateral to get commercial loans. Think about this, right? For a moment. You go apply for a loan. If you don't have too much money in the bank, too much reserve, the bank's gonna ask you, we're talking about SBA loan, to have some collateral. I didn't have more than my 35% down, no more collateral. That's all I had. So what the bank did was they trust, they had a lot of trust in me. I saw the, the, my financials and they helped me out. They said, Edgar, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use your business, your corporation C as collateral. What did I say? Sign me up. <laughs> you know, they tell me, Edgar, do you realize what you're doing right now? That if something goes wrong, they're gonna take your business as I didn't care because I believe in myself. You have to have that mindset, you know. I know that I'm going to be there learning more about the industry, taking classes, meeting clients. So I knew that I was going to be successful, you know. So I didn't care. I signed them, I signed immediately and I got the loan. Just want to I want to motivate you guys that this this is real. What I did here, you know, this is one of my many properties that I own. You know, go ahead. Just starting. That's right. So you didn't have any cash flow or anything. By the way, thank you for observing that. By the way, <laughs> I didn't want to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you a little story. You know, very personal, which is this: that I got my broker's license. You know how many clients I had. One client. This is what I said to myself. How can they be approving this loan? But they saw my, my projected, you know, cash flows, you know, for the next five years, my P and L, and I, in my backwards in finance, so I was able to really structure it in a way that is very healthy. My growth rate, like four or five percent every year. So they believe in me. But can you believe my my feeling that day that they approved my loan? And we close the escrow. What happens after you close the escrow in 30 days? 30 days after you, what do you need to do in 30 days? You have to pay your mortgage. 
How many clients do I have? One. I had to get to work, right? But, but you know, I was not scared. I loved it. Read the challenge on. So that's what I did. I went ahead and the next like six months, I was able to get like three more clients. So then I was able to read. And that's how I started growing my business. Start growing my business more and more and more. So basically it's, it's you are in control of your destiny. You know, sometimes uh, there may be obstacle in the road, you know, but you have to adjust, you have to be pragmatic, right? Go with the flow and make sure that you stay focused. So that's what happened. That story is real, you know? And I'm gonna take you one step further, okay? That person, the seller who's selling that property, we came to an agreement on the price. He was not ready, he needed some time to move. What did I do when I closed escrow? Huh? Aha, uh -huh. and how do you, uh, okay. hold that thought for a moment. That's right, when I go through idea, that's what I did. This is why I was able to breathe a little bit as well. I went ahead and leased back. I signed a lease with them for 12 months. So for 12 months, I was like relaxed, but I still was motivated to pick up more business, you know, because I don't want to be, you know, just uh, make it, you know? So that's, 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 that's a real story that would happen, you know? How many of you guys are thinking about purchasing something within the next, I don't wanna say six months, let's use two years, like a, like a 24 month period. Okay. By the way, everybody's online, everybody like 90% of the room is saying yes, you know? In your mind, how would you like to raise that capital since day one to purchase that first property? What's in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have um, just worked a couple of jobs at the time. I've been saving money, putting it into the stock market, a little bit of crypto. Um, okay. And then in the next couple of years, I'm also going to have some other uh, income streams. So I'm just going to continue saving that money. And then ideally, with the next two years, it's going to be enough for uh, like three and a half percent down payment for a first time homeowner. And then that's it. I mean, you guys, you see about my 35% here. You don't have to go 35%. I went 35% because this is a commercial loan. This is a minimum that you have to do, you know, on commercial loan. Most of the times like 30%, because if you go under 30%, you may be a negative, you know. But going back to your uh, explanation about how you are going to accomplish that first transaction, that's the way to do it. You get an FHA chain on, you don't need 10%, you don't need 20%, you only need three and a half to five percent. So that's the way to do it. Who else in the back? Somebody up there. Yeah. Uh, from what I know, commercial loans are not based on the income and I think that takes place that if you buy like five or six things and above. Uh, so um I work in tech. I plan to like save up in a year or two and yeah. be able to use that money to like Right. Yeah, and I want to tell you that's exactly right. When you to buy your multi family, they use on the calculation to be approved 70% of that income. Some lenders change, you know, it can be 70, 75%, sometimes 80, but 70, on average, 70% of that income. You know? So if it's a thousand dollars, they use $700 to qualify, you know. So that's, that's the way to do it. Anyways, uh, anybody online uh, making comments on that? Okay, so basically that's the idea that you know uh, that you can go ahead and uh, raise your capital. You can save money. You don't have to save thirty five percent. You can save like three and a half percent, five percent. You know, that's the way to do it. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. So this is uh, the reason why people are increasing their wealth. There's a lot of equity that a lot of my investors have in their property. The investors have realized that the building has appreciated so much. And they're right now because the interest rates are so low, you know? And 
there's what is called the effect of cap rate compression. Before I get into cap rate compression, let's talk about cap rate for a moment. And I know you guys learned this from uh, Anthony's class. Actually, that was the very first seminar, you know? And how many of you guys were here in the first seminar? All of you guys, most of you guys. Um, cap rate, right? What's the formula cap rate? Net operating divided by the purchase price. That's right. Net, net operating divided by purchase price gives you the cap rate. If, it's, if cap rate goes up, what happens to the income? Like it's correlation, right? Cap rate lows, income? Okay, how about the value? What happens to the value? Same thing. Right? So look what's happening right now in the market. This is a fact. We'll talk about cap rate compression in a moment, but I just want to make sure that we all are the same uh, wavelength as far as uh, financial indicators that we use, investors, my clients that use. This is this is how. Look at your um, your hands out and your preliminaries online as well, uh, if you can check. Uh, these are the uh, vital metrics that investors use. Everybody has that online as well. Yeah, great. So NOI, right? Gross effective income minus your operating expenses is your NOI. Gross effective income includes your vacancy. Right? If you have a vacancy, that's gonna be your GDI, right? Minus your operating expenses, that gives you your NOI, right? Basics, going back to basics, right? Cap rate, what Mo just said, you know? NOI divided by market value equals cap rate, right? The debt service, right? That's something to keep in mind when you are talking about cap rates. Your debt service is not included. In other words, that loan that we are, that loan that we talk about, the commercial loan, is not included in that cap rate. So that's something always to keep that in mind, you know? And that's part of the financial engineering that you can do to start comparing that and you start comparing your rates, interest rates as well. GRM, and I know, um, Anthony also talked to you guys about this and he uses GRM a lot, especially in Long Beach to compare different markets or sub markets in Long Beach. He can be also in the subway area, you know? Sometimes as brokers, we, instead of talking about cap rates, we talk about GRMs, you know? Is it like 10, is it 11, is it a 12? Is it an area of like 13 GRM, you know? That, that's, that's, that's the talk, the terminology that we use among investors and, and brokers. So what's the GRM? Market value divided by gross rental income, right? So that's, there's no work. So you don't have no, no operating expenses there, right? When you start calculating your GRMs, you know? And then of course you can talk about IRRs and then your NPVs. But basically the main two matrix that we use is your cap rate and your GRM. NOI is so important as well because this is this is your cash flow, right? This is that's how you're gonna be comparing like properties, you know. And eventually we're gonna go deeper into evaluating NOIs as well and cap rates. But this is basically on a surface level. We wanna make sure all of us are on the same page, you know. So this is this is why these are the metrics that investors today and in the past like 10 years they've been following. You know, this is not is the standard in the business. You know? Okay. So look at this example here. Um, can you do the honors if you don't mind, Hughes? Can you read uh, the first uh, paragraph here on the left? This one here? Right? Okay, how about you? Can you read the next one? Compression indicates that the price is in the market and investors perceive investment as a low risk So right now we're gonna learn this concept is beautiful. This 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 is what's been happening in the past year and a half, two years, especially in the past year, guys. It is it's it's amazing. This is this is why I love to go to work, by the way, because 
the multifamily industry is on fire. It has been on fire for over a year and a half, by the way, you know, because of this, guys. Okay, think about this, right? You purchase that 20 unit building, that four place. Let's say you have a few houses, right? And you know, in the past couple of years, because of COVID-19, we were not able to raise rents, right? It's a moratorium in California, right? So the income has been the same, right? Most of my clients, they own buildings for many, many years, you know? So cap rate compression, right? Look what's happening right now. Look at this example here. This client's been getting $80,000 per year. Cap rate, 8%. Value one million. He hasn't done anything to the building, right? This is like a four or five years ago. Over the past few years, same building, eighty thousand income, cap rate went down six percent. What happened to the value? Ooh, cap rate compression. How about in the past year and a half? Same property, cap rate. Right now the cap rates are like. Average three, four percent right now. Same income, right? What happened to the value? Up. Do you see this concept? It is, it, this is beautiful. I mean, can you imagine if you own a property, you haven't done anything at all, and then all of a sudden you look at the, the news, look at Zillow, Trulia, on the website, the MLS, and look at these prices selling for this much, this much, this much, you know? And then you said to yourself, oh my God, I gotta do something about this, you know? So this is what's happening right now. This property was 1 million a few years ago. How much is it now? 2 million, okay? I wanna give you a personal story that just happened to me just a few months ago, okay? This is, just, this is the standard what's happening in the industry. One of my clients asked me to evaluate his property about almost two years ago in North Tone, in uh, South Tone, fourplex. I value the property at 1.35, 1.35, okay? For you, prime location, 235th Street, very nice. Uh, Sepulveda in uh, Maple, you know, if you're in the South, from the South area, you may know where that is located. Guess how much I just closed escrow on that building? It was 1.35. Just give me a guess. Here in the back. Yeah. Okay, how about you? Okay. Can, can you imagine just by just saying two? I mean, this is like a year and a half, right? What's the difference between 1.35 and two? That's six, how much? 650, right? Can you imagine I, I close escrow at 2 million 50? Same rents. This is a fact, by the way. And this is a transaction. I, I it took me about three months to complete because, and we'll get to the bottom uh, to all the fundamentals right now, but I just want to give you a little taste of my world, you know? This client, 1.35, I sold 2.50. Who represented him? Remember that example I gave you about the commissions? Well, four, five, six percent. This is one way that you can raise capital. You know, just put, I just want to give you an example that that's one avenue besides saving money. If you want to have a, a career in the industry, in brokerage, this is one way to do it. And it's a fact, you know. <laughs> Bless you. So basically, that's what I did. So he had all this money. And keep in mind the problem. What do you, how much do you think is the debt he's balancing in his mortgage? He owned a building more than 20 years. What do you think the balance is? Right. Do you think he's happy with me? <laughs> I mean, he has in the bank 2 million 50. Okay. Just, just put that in back of your mind, you know? But keep in mind, this is a 1031 exchange class. We gotta pay taxes on all that money, right? So we have to find ways to defer legally, all those taxes, right? That's a structure, that's a way to do it, you know? But I just wanna give you a little taste of my world, you know? This is, this is, this is what I do. Uh, 
are these cute slides that I created. <laughs> it's basically, I'm so, I'm so excited about 1031 exchanges, by the way. I read so many books and I'm, I'm gonna show you guys. In your handout, look at the last page in your handout online, the preliminaries. Look at the last page of the preliminaries, if you don't mind. This is one of like many books that you can find on 1031, you know? So this is one book that I recommend. It gives you a little history of uh, how that 1031 exchange came about. This is a, a log or a code that has been in the marketplace for over a hundred years, guys, you know? And it has a few variations, but the same concept, you know? But we're gonna be learning in this class. So basically <laughs> in this slide right here is gonna condense like, oh, you're gonna read in this book, you know, on this slide. So I tried to make it fun. So just to give you a perspective of uh, the background, you know. So basically 1921, that's when the, the code was created. It used to be called 202. Then they switched to 1112. Then 1935, they invented the accommodator. We'll talk about that in a moment. In 1954, that's when the change was, the code was changed to 1031 is the IRC code and internal revenue code. That's where the 1031 is coming from. That's the history there, you know? Uh, you, can you read what it says right there uh, on the box, 1979? Yeah. By the way, what's your name again? Spencer. Okay, thank you, Spencer. By the way, this is, if you are going to learn about the history of 1031, all you gotta do is just learn about what's in this box. Everything began from this family, the Starker family. His name is TJ Tarker, the Starker, and his son, Bruce. They own timber, a timberland area of timber. What he wanted to do, he wanted to do an exchange do an exchange with another company, the Crown Company, Crown Seller, to exchange Timberland for property. It's a simple transaction, right? They wanna, we're talking about more than like 50, 60 years ago, you know? The IRS didn't allow him to do that. He took the case all the way to the Supreme Court and he won. Because of this case, Everything has been going on in the past like 50, 60, 60 years. It's this case right here. He won the case. So what happens is that when you do a 1031 exchange, you have to hire or assign an accommodator, a third party who's gonna be holding the funds on your behalf. So what happens is this, that he wanted to make this transaction in five years, right? So. That's too long of a time. So this is why this case is very important is because the course shortened that time from five, five years to six months, 180 days. And it makes sense actually, you know, actually the decision is excellent that they made, you know, because I think five years is a long time to tell someone, you know what, I'm gonna sell my timberland, you give me your property, but we conclude, we execute that transaction in five years. So I, I understand why. And another reason why uh, this was not allowed is because of, think about this, right? If you put money in the bank, you have a growth factor, right? Growth rate, yeah? You, you earn interest, right? In Timberland, they made a case that the timber is still gonna grow. So, so that's, that also has value to the land. So this is why the five-year period is just too long. So this is this is what happened here. The U.S. Congress adopted a 45-day calendar identification uh, time period in 180 days that you have to complete the transaction. And this is when also you have to separate what's residential and what's commercial, you know, as far as your depreciation. Let's talk about depreciation for a moment. Who can tell me depreciation? Have you heard that concept before? Go ahead. Oh, you can, 
write off the value of the amount itself that you put in the subsidy of those. Yes, that's right. So everybody heard that what he said? Who else raised the hand? Anybody else? Okay, so basically he's right. So that depreciation is, is one of your best friends, you know? It's like an expense, but it's to your benefit, you know? So you are going to use that depreciation as a tax shelter every month. So they calculate, so you can calculate it per month. And then when you do your taxes, it's, you know, you do the annual calculations, you know, for one year. And by the way, in my formula that we'll talk about this uh, later in my model, I already, this is what I do on a daily basis, by the way. I, I calculate that for my clients. You know, if you have the finance background, you're gonna love this. And I'm gonna be able to share also my model with you guys and I'll, I'll send you the, uh, uh, the spreadsheet as well. So, because it's the Stark, Starker family, this case, this is when the, the Congress and now the industry adopted this. In commercial property, you are, you are depreciating to 39 years and residential 27.5. By the way, this is a fact. It's been going on for more than, since 19, 1986. So what they do, they, because of this case, the depreciation is going to be straight line. Very, so they made it very basic. So that's the history of 1031 and change, you know? Basically, you can depreciate into 27 and a half years or 39 years, you choose, you know? Most of my clients, by the way, they, they use the 27.5 years because that, that's too long. You know, when it's like 39, it's just long. Most of them probably would have done a 1031 exchange or just perhaps sell the property, you know? So it's, so most of the time that's, that's what they use, 27.5 years. So look at this, what's happening here in the next slide, guys. Capital gains. Taxes are triggered when investors sell an asset for a higher price then it's acquisition, right? That's the capital gains. So they have to pay taxes on capital gains. So this class right here, this session, this seminar we're talking about right now is going to help you how you're gonna be deferring and the advantage of doing that. And this is one way that you can really create wealth. What number does it say here? You in the back. What does it say here? Can you imagine <laughs> one dollar, right? For that capital gain, every dollar you have to give up 62 cents. This is a fact, by the way. You have to pay 20 percent for long, long term capital gains, you have to pay 3.8 percent for health care. This is like the Medicare that state California charges, you know, 13.3 percent up to 13.3 percent for California state tax. And that depreciation we talked about. When you sell the property, you have to pay taxes on that depreciation. Remember, he said that it's going to be a tax shelter for you. You know, when you sell the property, you have to put that money back. You have to account for that money back. You know, so when you recapture that depreciation amount, you pay twenty five percent. I mean, I mean, this is this discourages anybody from doing what you want to do. Also, you know one property, right? And then you want to sell and buy another one, you know, you have to pay capital gain. So we're gonna begin from, this is like, we, we, right now we, we're beginning from, from the floor right now, you know, to keep this in mind, right? So we have to find ways to make sure that we don't step into that shoes or the starter family, right? To make sure that we follow it the right way, how we go about to increase your wealth, and defer these taxes. Eventually, you have to pay it, you know? But by the way, you can have a strategy to have these taxes deferred next five years, 10 years, or you can give it to your next generation as well. And you can go on, this, this can go on like forever, forever. You know, this is one way that you can really have a lot of wealth. You can get to that 50 in the building, 200 in the building, 200 in the building, have a portfolio of property. This is, this is if you learn this technique that we're gonna uh, learn today, uh, we're gonna be very wealthy soon. So just keep that in mind and it's gonna, what's coming up in the class is gonna be exciting. Let's, 
Let's take a little uh, like five minute break, if you don't mind, and then uh, we'll continue. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's recorded. Oh, no, so <laughs> it's like it's 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 Yes, I'll be here. I'll be here. And you're your child. Thank you. I will. It's a all of his presentation here. And that was the
Are any of you guys going to the law school in September? You got my email about parking? Sorry, you got my email about parking? Um, I did not get that one. It was kind of at the bottom, it was bold. Okay, I'll have to go back and check. Yeah, it. I think it's the main email. It's a yeah. Um, it's the LMU, um, the Law School Real Estate Society. But do you mean, does it count as a REACT event? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But the REACT isn't technically putting it on, but we're giving you guys credit as a REACT event because uh, there, there will be stuff like, I think uh, Edgar's going to be there actually. And a couple of, I think Erwin from last time might be there. Awesome. A couple of them emailed me, but I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. So you will get credit for it, but it's not technically a REACT event for the next one. You guys on Tuesdays get back home tomorrow? I don't know what the, what the setup is on, uh, on Tuesday. I'm involved with everything on this campus, but I'm not really involved with anything over there. Yeah, yeah parking's free. Tomorrow. Just you gotta go get, get validated. Okay. okay. Check my email. Check the email again. If you don't see it, email me and I'll forward it out. Okay. I'll put that on my Yeah. Thank you. Because mine is like 12 bucks. Yeah. Which isn't the end of the world. 12 bucks is 12 bucks. The fair, fair, the one on the Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Shot, it's in this shot, room and a couple other ones. Yeah. What's the layout? So those are like round tables. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Okay, we're gonna see for, uh, for one of the presenters. I can't make it, and then there will be yeah. people who are on to so yeah. yeah. kind of rotate in. So you guys are gonna rotate yeah. in or talk to everybody. Okay. Usually, yeah. go, but you guys are gonna stay. I check it out. Yeah. I got twelve to five points five on camera. Okay, we're back. <laughs> I've been talking for an hour, guys. I've been thinking for your patients. You know, something was telling me I gotta take a break. <laughs> I'm glad we did, right? So we'll take another break. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna let's go now. Exponentially deep. You know, is that okay? All right, let's do that. Okay, this is the fun part, right? Let's get to the fun part right now. Okay, let's talk about. Type of property that you cannot online, you cannot. This this type of property you cannot do a 1031 exchange. Right. You have the handouts, okay, and the preliminaries as well. So let's read the first one here. here. What's the first one? Uh, primary residence. What's a primary residence? Where you live, can you do a 1031 exchange? No. no. Let's let's clarify that. Okay. No, you cannot do that. Okay. Next thing. Read the second one. Second home. What's the second home? Right. A cabin in Big Bear. You know, Lake Tahoe. Can you do a 1031 exchange? No, because it's personal use. Okay. How about you? Third one. Right, including equipment, inventory, and goodwill. Right, that could be part of that business opportunity. You know, you own that coffee shop, you own that business. Yeah, you say that the purpose for the company and say it's an engagement on the side of the thing. Oh, by the way, what you said right now, these are, uh, I don't want to say the loopholes. But this is something that if you learn this one right now, then uh, you're gonna be like three steps ahead. Well, everybody online as well. Airbnb, right? You talking about how many days in one year? How many days one year has? Three sixty-five. Right? So always keep this in mind, right? One hundred and eighty days. If you're gonna rent it for one hundred and eighty days more, then you're okay. But if it's less than one hundred and eighty days, you're not okay. Got it? So you can do that because that you have to, you have to activate trigger in your track return, what is called the schedule E. The schedule E is when you're gonna be reporting all that real estate assets. You know, so good question. Okay, uh let's go to the fifth one. Uh you're here. Flipping property, not intended to rent. What is that? Flipping property. We heard this once all the time, right? This term, you know. Give me an example of flipping a property. Uh, a scenario. Buying a house for like a low 
love Christ and your eyes and so on as well as Christ. Right. Look what I put after that. Not intended to rent, right? When you're flipping a property, it was never intended to rent. So that's the idea there. So that's not eligible for 1031 exchange, you know? So now we got the basics right now, right? So you cannot do a 1031 exchange on this type of property. So what is a 1031 exchange? It's a process that allows investors to avoid capital gains when you sell the investment. That's page 13, by the way, in your preliminaries. Uh, you have uh, seven benefits. You increase your cash flow. You improve your quality of real estate. In my model that I created, by the way, we'll talk about this, the, uh, the seven benefits. Look at your handout, your preliminaries. It's the second page before the last one. And you'll see those uh, seven benefits that I have uh, uh, generated. And we can take a look at it right away, if you don't mind. Look at those seven benefits. So basically the seven benefits is better location, newer buildings, better mix, more units, improved cash flow, more fair market value and cheaper debt. Those are the seven benefits why someone would want to do a 1031 exchange. And it doesn't have to be seven. It can be one or interrelated. It can be one or two or three or four. When I say ding, 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 this means something. What happens at the end of the seminar, guys? I'm gonna ask you guys for three questions, right? So when you hear cling, 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 it's to give you a little hint to remember, right? Because this is something that you can remember, hopefully for a long time, why some investors and yourself would want to do a 1031 exchange, you know? Uh, read the first one, if you don't mind me. What's the first one? The more fair market value, the same as that value better. Right. The next one? Um, uh, maintenance is lower, less repair. Okay, keep going. Seven. Yeah. It just says seven. Yeah. So basically, uh, more units. When you have more units, you're gonna have increased your cash flow. Better location. If you purchase a property, let's say in one area, and you wanna get a better area, that's another way that is a benefit. You know. Better mix. If you buy, let's say, an apartment building mostly one bedrooms, you always want to have more bedrooms per unit, generally speaking. So if you have an apartment building, let's say mostly one bedroom studios, you want to have you know, purchase an apartment building that have two bedrooms and three bedrooms. Why is that good? Why do you think it's, we want to move from one bedrooms to two and three bedrooms, generally speaking? because the tenancy is extended. Generally speaking, that tenant who lives in a one bedroom is going to move out probably within the next like two, three years, approximately, you know? But that family who lives in a two, three bedroom is gonna stay in that unit for, for a while. So that's, that's another benefit that you can very want to change. You may find a building that has more, a better unit mix, so you can graduate from like a two, one bedroom and studio to purchase in a building has maybe two units that are one bedrooms and maybe like 18 units that are like two bedrooms. You know, that's, that's another advantage and benefit of doing the 10 to the one exchange. Okay, so going back to the purchase, right? When you are selling the property and you make that money, capital gains, you don't wanna pay capital gains. So someone has to hold that money. Remember that example I gave you guys, that building that I sold for 2 million 50, that client of mine had that money. If he has access to that money, it triggers capital gains. So that investor cannot touch that money. So that money has to go to a third party, 
what is called the accommodator. The accommodator is the third party who holds the sales proceeds on your behalf. And that person is going to also purchase the property on your behalf. This is a, an example of an exchange agreement here. And this is like very basic, but it's gonna, it, it tells you in detail about how you are empowering that accommodator to hold the funds on your behalf. So right here, you can see the terms here. It, it tells you that the exchanger that, who is you, the investor, desires only to exchange relinquished property for lifetime profit to replacement property. So we're gonna call that property you're gonna be selling, we're gonna call this property relinquished property. The one that you're gonna be purchasing is called replacement property. So you relinquish a property for a replacement property. So this property here, property A, relinquished property, two unit building, perhaps a fourplex, 10 units, 100 units, you have to purchase a replacement property. Right? So do you see what it says right there in on the um, second line it says like kind property? Like kind. You have to replace that property for the same value or more. I repeat, that property you're gonna replace has to be same value or more of that relinquished property. So if you sold the property, my client, right? So if I give you the example, 1.35, he sold it for 2.50. So that's a relinquished property. The replacement property, he has to purchase another property for how much? 2.50, 2 million 50. It has to be the same, okay? So this is what lifetime. Many, many investors, 75% of them, they don't get this concept. And this is why they hire like myself or someone who's an expert about giving them those details. But now you're gonna become very good about this. And, and, and I hope by the end of the seminar today, you're gonna be able to have that language, you know? So like, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So the practice, is it better to like take that 2.5 million and by the way, that exercise that you're talking about, and by the way, what you said right now, there's no right or wrong answer, by the way, is basically up to your list, list appetite. And we're gonna get into deep talk about a case study, by the way, that's gonna great. But the answer to your question on my example, I just talked to you guys about, the 2 million 50, he purchased two. I represented actually the seller and the buyer in that transaction. So 2 million 50. So can you imagine uh, how exciting it is? It, it's, it, it can be exciting, but at the same time, it's a little pressure, right? That you really have to find a replacement property, right? So I, this is why I love what I do. Like I, I'm always like thinking before the transaction, right? I don't wait until the transaction happens. So I have, I have some potential property that they can purchase. So my client purchased one property in Granada Hills, another property in Fresno. So that's what he did. You know, he diversified his portfolio. Actually, he was thinking about his family, his, their kids, you know? One daughter is gonna take one and the son another one. So the decision that he made is wonderful, by the way. It's wonderful, it's, it's very healthy. It's a, it's a quality of, of life as well. You know, that's why he did you know? and, and Anyway, so like kind is not that it has to be the same. You know, oh, I sold a four unit building, I have to buy a four unit building, you know? I saw a multifamily, I have to buy a multifamily. It's, it's, it's not about that, it's more about, exactly, it is about the value. Like kind is the value, okay? It's the value, keep that in mind. By the way, with that 2 million 50, what would you have done? Me? Yeah. yeah. If I'm gonna go to the exchange, I have to like buy a property that's worth Right. What, what property? Yeah, I would try to diversify. Diversify, right? Yeah. And how how would you diversify? Uh, 
So we know that you're not going to buy one, right? That's yeah. in your mind, right? So you have 2 million 50 online, 2 million 50. He says that he's not going to buy one, he'll buy multiple. Yeah. So what would you buy? Based on Anthony's plan, I I have this in mind because I want to basically use the lever and make more money down the line. That's right. And that's what you said. Diversify your table to make more money. That is right. And by the way, I, we're gonna move forward right now a little bit uh, in, in the session right now. But how, how are you gonna leverage that? We're gonna go to the bank and get a loan, right? Yeah. And so we're gonna get a loan to increase our cash flow. That's how you leverage, right? By the way, my client didn't do that. He just buy those two properties and pay cash. By the way, oh, that's the decision he made. But I'm gonna say this: is, everybody has their own uh, risk appetite. Like, like for, for, for instance, you guys have a long way to go, right? So you're not thinking about I want to pay pay off my loan, <laughs> correct? You're thinking about leveraging right now. I'm pretty sure he he was thinking about like, like what you're thinking, like maybe 20 years ago, right? So maybe it's about staying focused on, on taking those baby steps, you know? So, yeah, go ahead. I have a quick two-part question. Yeah. So first part, um, so after you, like, let's just say you do the type of work, get to 45 million or 250. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can- And by the way, I'm not to interrupt you. I want to tell you just a little footnote. The 50, how did that 50 come about? Can you imagine 2 million? I represented the buyer, right? I had six offers. On that property, six offers. That's what's happening in the marketplace right now. You know, people are overbidding on property. On property. That's how the fifty came about. Somebody offered an extra fifty grand, and we, we took that offer. So continue. Yeah. So you have the two million fifty. Yeah. Um, so you can either purchase. Let's just say you purchase a property that, that's worth two million fifty outright, or yeah. Can you also do like a down payment and get a new loan for a lower value right property? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And by the way, uh, let's. Dive into that now, okay? You mentioned about a loan. This this uh, specific example had no loan, right? But he had a loan before. Yeah. His loan was like about three hundred thousand, approximately. When you do a temporary one exchange, listen to this, guys. The replacement property has to be also the same debt or more. Same debt or more? Go ahead. Same debt originally or same debt that you owe? Same debt that you owe. 300,000, right? You can also bring cash into the transaction on the replacement property. So let's say my, my client, right? No debt, right? He just paid in full. You didn't want to go to the bank and borrow another three hundred thousand, so you can take that route. You can you can keep going and, and get another loan for the replacement property because you meet that requirement of the three hundred thousand, or you can bring an extra three hundred thousand cash in the transaction. So you're not obligated to keep borrowing money as long as you have enough reserve to cover that debt. Does that make sense? Okay. Someone asked. Can you do a temporary one exchange with an asset that is already paid off? Yeah, you can do it. That's right. The question is can you do a temporary one exchange with an asset that is paid off, meaning that there's no debt, right? Which is the example I just gave you right now. So the answer, the answer is yes. You can do a temporary one exchange and buy a replacement property. Keep in mind that what you are trying to defer is the taxes, maybe the 62% I showed you paying taxes on, on that profit that you made. And also, which includes that depreciation and includes that state tax as well. So the answer to the question is yes, you can do that online. Excellent question, Adam. thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you explain to us on payment property? And so now you just have to pay those tax. Good point, by the way. And this is, uh, this is one of the reasons a lot of clients, they, pay capital gains on that difference. And by the way, I have situations where clients, they don't mind about paying the, they don't mind paying the capital gains. 
So that's another strategy that this guy would have done. Think about this, right? Two million and fifty, right? He can just use, let's say, it's just a, a rough number. Let's say 1.5. 1 1.5, 1 and then he has 550 left, right? Say, so you know what? I don't mind paying the tax, but I don't want to pay money. The answer is, yeah, you can do that. Right? So, so it's basically it's a matter of your risk appetite. Is what's your perspective in that two million fifty? What would you have done? I don't know. Um, I was older. No, but like right now, like this. this well, right, you I, know, right now, let's take focus so we can share your mindset with everybody. I, I, would you buy an, a, a, this, another property for two million fifty, or buy two or three or four? Um, I guess it depends on what I'm buying. Good point. Or because if I if it was like a multi-unit building, yeah. I didn't really want to put any energy. <laughs> that's right. Remember what we talked about in the class? Remember? That's the only reason that a lot of investors don't want to do with the head of management. Remember that cute video that Chris showed you last week on the property management? You're right, you know? And by the way, I want to point out to you that this particular client, his property was very well managed low maintenance that he had a reason to sell the property what was the trigger what trigger him buying that property 1.35 <laughs> year and a half ago 250 that's a huge motive right because we have those seven benefits that we talked about yeah great okay let's continue here so basically this is the uh the line kind transaction here. This is us right here, right? We are going to sell this building and then we're going to give it to the accommodator. He has the money back, the exchange agreement. So it's just going to be signing, and you're going to be signing that exchange agreement, you know, with the accommodator. So you're going to empower on your behalf to hold the funds on your behalf. And then when you find a replacement property, you go ahead and, and that accommodator is going to purchase that replacement property. See? So the whole funds on behalf of the seller and then the accommodator performs that transaction for you. So basically the big picture here, this is, this is the connection here between you, the investor to the accommodator and then the accommodator is gonna purchase the property on your behalf and you're gonna do a temporary wife change. Time period. What do we say the time period we have to do? Not five years, right? The Starker family case, they shortened the time to, that's right, six months, 180 days, right? From, from five years to 180 days, six months. And then what happens before the six months? They give you that 45 days identification day. So this, we're gonna get super in detail right now because granular right now, we're gonna go in detail as far as identifying properties and how do we go about to identify properties, okay? Okay, let's go to the next one. So day one, and by the way, this process, the fundamentals are super mandatory and they keep track your CPA, the IRS, everyone keeps track of the time. This is not something that nobody's gonna know. Everybody's going to know. So if you know how to follow these fundamentals, you are ready to do that thing we wanna change in the future. The clock start ticking from day one, okay? Okay, so today we sold the property, right? We have 45 days that we have to identify property to purchase. Yes. You know, and by the way, this is, when I started in the business, I used to think that it was business. I wanna tell you, oh, the weekends here, don't worry, you know, Friday's here and we have an extra couple of days, Saturday and Sunday, Monday comes weekend, we still look into property. No, kind of days. So every, not every day counts, every second counts. Every second counts. You cannot go back in time after that 45 days, okay? 
and, and then you have to close in 80 days. Okay, so let's start from the beginning, right? The beginning day, 45, right? Day one, you have 45 days to identify the properties they're gonna buy. And then remember, you have to close in 180 days, right? So on day 45, how many days left do you have? 135 days, right? So now you have 135 days that you have to complete the transaction. Why is that 45 day important? Because there are three specific rules that you have to follow. And you have to choose one of those three rules, which is called the identification rules. So within that 45 days, you have to satisfy this rule. And keep in mind, these are forms that you have to, they're gonna stamp the date. So this is why it's super important. You can do it on day one, two, three, up to 45 days to identify the properties. And then after 135 days, then you close escrow and you, then you complete the transaction. So here's, here's the fundamental. Here's a chart that you can follow, you know? So these are the three rules. Okay, let's read the first one here. Three property rules. Okay, so three property rule. So within 45 days, you've been looking, you gotta identify three properties. Oh, I found one property in Torrance. I found another property in Los Angeles. I, I found another property in Silmar. Or maybe I found a property out of state, or perhaps I found a property in the valley, you know? So you identify three, three properties. So it tells you that a maximum of three properties may be identified, no limit on the number of value. So the property can be 1 million, another one for 2 million, another for 500,000, right? So that's, that's one rule. Second rule, 200% rule, no limit on the number of property as long as they don't exceed 200% of the value. Remember that example I gave you guys, the 2 million 50? On the 200% rule, up to how much can he buy? Double that, right? So it'll be 4 million 100, right? If you sell one at 500,000, if you want to satisfy the two rule, you can purchase a property up to a million. Do you see the connection? Tell me the difference between the three property rule and the 200% rule. Someone. So, which one of the rules do we, do we follow them? Uh, are they guidance? Uh, are they legal rules? So, do you think it's elaborate on this again? Excellent question, by the way. So because of this case, starter case, that's when it was determined, the Congress determined that you have to identify properties within 45 days. Right? And so there are only what, three categories that you have to satisfy. Three property rule, 200% rule. But we talk about the next one, okay? And then we can evaluate the three and to see which one you would choose. You have to follow like a board. That's right. Remember I showed you that ex exchange agreement? Yeah. There's also a form that your accommodator is gonna give you where you're gonna be using one of these three rules. So the property rule. And by the way, the point here, everybody online is that you cannot do it on day 45, 46, excuse me. You cannot do it on day 80. You have to do it within 45 days. This is why uh, they give you that flexibility. Can you imagine how you feel on day 44 if you haven't found a property that you really want, right? The stress levels, 
high, right? So how do you minimize the stress? You start looking for property before the 45 days. When do you think I started looking for that client? I started looking since when he called me and said, Edgar, you know what? Let's, <laughs> let's sell that building. I was, I was contacting everybody that I knew in the next like couple of weeks to find identifying property that he would like, you know? So this is why I love my business. I love what I do, you know? Because if you can understand this, your clients is gonna trust your knowledge about something that, a concept that can be uh, perhaps complex, but once you have done over a hundred transactions, <laughs> it has become second nature to you. Imagine this, right? After we talk, have this conversation right now, if you take this class again, and then again, and then you do another transaction, you, you're gonna become like an expert. Like immediately, you're gonna pick it up right away, you know? Okay, let's talk about the 95% rule. Go ahead. Um, what's the process to identify three properties? Yeah. Are they 100? That's right. So he said that you chose the three property rule. You identify three or maybe two. It doesn't have to be three. Let's say three. And then in the future on the 100 day, you found a, a better one. Oh my God, I love that building. Forget about those three. So the answer, can you do that? Yeah, you can do that, but you're not going to do that. Then you want to change it in a minute. It's already X. You cannot do that online. You cannot do that. So this is. This is a, a, a code, a rule. It's a fact that you have to abide, you have to follow. Yeah. You know? yeah. What happens if you don't choose to do the things that you did not choose to do? X. And then you get taxed. And That's right. Taxed. And how much are you going to be taxed? Uh, 65. 62, right? 62, yeah. at, at a minimum. Yeah. It, it recapture depreciation. You're going to pay that 25% of your loan. Long term capital gains at 20%. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an insane amount of money, right? If, okay. And by the way, it's not bad to do that if you want to put some cash in, in your pocket, right? Like the example we talked about before, perhaps you sell it, you have 2.50 and then you, you find 1.5, and then the balance, you can pay taxes and put your money in your pocket. That's another strategy. It's okay to pay the 62% because then that you only pay. The government, the state of California, and they put money in your pocket. This is right. No problem. 95% rule. How many of you guys want to have a portfolio property? Okay. This is where you come in. 95% rule. To be honest, if you don't mind, read the 95% rule. Yeah. What's your name again? Lindsay. Hi. So this one, this is the rule that you have to follow, especially those clients that have in a portfolio five buildings, 10 buildings, three properties. That example that you gave about that you want to have a portfolio of houses, you know, that may be the 95% rule. Go ahead. I do have a general question yeah. about what do you do. So do you act as the accommodator or do you provide the accommodator for your you know what? I made that. Thanks for asking that question. Observe it that, yeah. I own a commercial brokerage company, and I made a decision since day one that I want to represent clients who are investors in commercial and industrial real estate. And I set up my own. But the commissions, by the way, are very set. Are not setting in stone. Everything's negotiable. Now think about this for a moment, right? What's four percent of one million? How about five percent? How about six percent? Okay, so I charge six percent. You know. So this is one way that you can take that avenue to become a broker. You know, or you can take the avenue to become an accommodator as well. You know, 
you can take that avenue. You know? So it depends how you want to set up your career. You know? But keep in mind the accommodator has is a third party, right? So keep that in mind. You know? So do you get do you find the accommodator to help facilitate the you got it. That's right. People that you have trusted and they have done many transactions in the past. Yeah. And someone that is as a bond and is reliable, you can become an accommodator as well. So basically, after school, if you get your license, you can become an accommodator and find people like me and a hundred people like me. That can be a career for you as well. So that's that's your answer. Good question. Yeah. Uh, are accommodated accommodators they, uh, paid based on commission as well? They so remember everything's negotiable, right? Yeah. So it's your business, right? You can set up the business as a percentage or a flat fee. So you know if you have volume, you know you can go ahead and have a flat fee that is very competitive. So you don't have to rely on percentages. You can do that or make the transaction on percentage as well. You know. So you determine that, you make that decision. What do you think is better? Flat fee or percentage? That's a- Money wise, I think. Percentage is better. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. How about you in the back? I would get the same. Okay, raise your hand who wants percentage. Who wants flat fee? Ah. No, I'm with you, 100%. But anyways, that everything's negotiable. So, Three, three property rule, 200% rule, and the 95% rule. You know, 95% rule, you can list 10 buildings, 20 buildings, 50 buildings. There, there's, no, there's no limit. But why do they set up that rule of 95%? Because you have to purchase 95% of those properties. Follow me, come on. Tell me that, uh, explain that to me, the 95% rule, if you don't mind, in your own words. Sure. Um, yeah. So that means that we're not going to be able to leverage debt in this case because we're only purchasing 95% of the property. That's right. That's exactly right what he said right now. So it's not about the debt, it's more about the 95% rule, the value, you know? When you list on the form, you have to buy 95% of it. So we're going to have equity in 95% of this. That's right. That's right. It's like more than four problems. You guys are so smart. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so basically, think about this, right? For a moment. If you list this one, this 95%, first of all, you have to understand that. If you're gonna list three properties, and are you gonna, you're gonna be using the 95% rule? It's not necessary because you already have the three property rule, right? This is more when you are a uh, more sophisticated investor, where you gotta start valuing each, the value of this property, and you're gonna realize that, okay, I can buy 95% of the value combined of all these buildings. So this is where your financial engineering comes in. You can, you can start valuing those properties to see how much they're worth. And the combined value has to be at least 95% of the multiple buildings that you're going to be uh, putting in, in, that, in the list. So you can put, let's say, a 10 unit building, two houses, one condo, 100 unit building. Right? So you can have a combination, right? As long as it goes to 95%. Oh, you know, I'm at night, I'm at 80%, I still need 50%. Okay, I'll buy that condo. And I'll add that condo to my portfolio. That's just my example. You know, that's how, how that's how investors they, they are diversified and they, they make their portfolio very sophisticated, you know, because of this. If you follow this 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 rule, you understand this one, you're like now you're got into the business, <laughs> I want to tell you, you know. Tell me, what is that 200% rule in your own words, the 200%? As I understand, like, because it's 
If you sell the property for one million, yes. I could buy. Uh, exactly, you can buy for two million. But mm -hmm. what I don't understand is that my classes of rule. So if I sold for one million, I could buy anything. If, if I do it, I, 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 I want to clarify something. If he's going to make comments, but I want to clarify something, right? Remember, I told you about the portfolio that when you have in your mind, exit out because you're having your mind one property, you know. Oh, yeah, right. Put in your mind 10 of those, okay. then that's a, that's when it's applicable. Okay, no, don't put in your mind one, don't put in your mind, put 10, 20, 50, 6, right. Uh, can I start with your name real quick? Sandra. Sandra. Okay. So I Sandra is your name? Chris. Sandra and Chris. Yeah. Okay. So my thinking about this, and I could totally be wrong because I'm still learning. Yeah. But so when you use 95% rule, you're buying 95% equity of the, of the property. And so because of that, you're going to be paying most of the house and you're not going to have a lot of debt. That's going to be good for cash flow because you're renting it because you're not going to be paying much in rent. But if instead you were to go for a different uh, like if you want to like buy the property for twenty five percent, then you're going to be building your debt worth faster because you're leveraging your debt, and then every month you pay rent, you're going to be increasing the equity of your house. Um, That's right. And yeah, so you're going to have a low lower uh, monthly cash cash flow if you uh, leverage if you buy like every five percent of the house. Um, so it's just a difference of if you want to do if you want to have cash flow, if you want to, if you want to build your debt. Yeah. So basically, it's what you are going to structure, right? How you cut debt. Your debt and equity. That's what he's talking about. Debt and equity. Right. When you purchase a property, down payment, right? Down payment is debt or equity. Down payment is equity. And then you have to get a loan, right? Debt. Right. So let's say it's a hundred thousand and you put a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, let's say let's use a hundred thousand, right? Property. And you put twenty thousand down payment. So twenty percent, twenty thousand down payment is your equity and then the 80 will be your debt so that he's right so it depends on your risk appetite you want to borrow more or less that's what he's talking about it's if you understand that concept right away what he's talking about right now he, uh, he went very deep and i love that and everybody online i hope uh, we follow what he said it's, it's more about how much debt you want to have on the property you know if you want to leverage a lot or not, you know, that's why you 95% rule is for that sophisticated investor who evaluates and analyzes each building to find out if your cap rate works or not, to find out is that debt service is cheap. Remember the seven benefits? One of the benefits is that you can have a cheaper debt, right? This is another way that you can it will trigger you doing a 1031 exchange. If you had, let's say, a debt service of 6%, but right now the rates are like 4%, that's debt service, right? So you can, you can borrow more money at a cheaper rate, and then you can leverage and have more cash flow coming back. So he's right what he's talking about, you know? So this is this, if you understand these three rules, you know, it's basically where you want to be. All of us, we need to be here, right? Remember in the beginning of the session that we talked about, we wanted to have about 20 unit, multiple homes, perhaps a lot of our townhouses, you know? We wanna be here, you know? But anyways, so if you represent clients, clients, they look at this one. Let's say if you are entry level or want to, you know, perhaps buy your second or third home, you wanna start thinking about your 200% rule or perhaps the three property rule. Yeah. Ask a question. Yeah. Um, so why would somebody want to use the two hundred percent rule? Because it seems like that makes you seem better. Yeah. Exactly. So basically, when um, you have to understand that uh, when you are in a syndication or you have uh, partners, you know, you have to have the same state of mind, right? You have the same philosophy of investment. So it's very simple when you use that two hundred percent rule to talk to your partner. Hey, let's say I've got $2 million property. 
and I know we have to purchase something before leaving. It's very simple to convince all the clients, all your investors, all your partners to engage in that process, you know? But and this is very important to the case of the property that you can make what is what is the property exactly like the same floor you can't do the that's right. That's exactly you got it. Actually, the way that you I clarified that is good. So you cannot can you repeat it again if you don't mind? So the property you're changing. The property you're changing. The property you're changing. The property, the property, the property the replacement property. The, replacement. the relinquished property, and then you buy a replacement property. Yeah, that's right. So your current property is that value. And obviously, uh, the, sorry, the property you currently have. That relinquished have, property. The relinquished property value. Cannot be only two times the price of. It'll be two times. Less than two times the price of. The replacement property. Yeah, so it can be, it cannot exceed two times the value of the replacement property. That is correct. Yeah. And you have to buy it a lease. Oh, and is there, there's no limit on the number of properties you can buy. That's right. And that's how it differs from three properties. That's right. Okay. And, and by the way, guys, this is, uh, can you believe that now we we're getting the hang of it uh, as far as the difference? And we've only been here for like, talking about this for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right? Can you imagine how an expert you're going to become after doing a hundred transactions? Or when you buy that second, third property, you're going to, you're going to understand this one like easily. Like, do you believe that 75% of the investors in the marketplace, they don't want to get into this step? Because understanding this, uh, it's not that it's complicated. It basically, you have to really understand all the connection with that money and make sure that you follow the right way, which is what we're doing there. Yeah. Are you responsible for Right, so basically the appraiser, he's asking the very time you're responsible to hire the appraiser. I want to ask a question. Yes, I'll get to that one. Uh, so with the 95% rule, I would have to close 9.5 mil of the aggregate value of the What? Then my babies, then my easy slides. Yeah. <laughs> so my cash flow would increase, but you need a ton of liquidity first. Is this on the right track? Yeah, it is on the right track. One thing is going to boil down to the risk appetite that you have. You can type that if you like, you know. According to your risk appetite. According to your risk appetite, you know. 9.5, yeah? So if, if you have 9.5, you can just buy another one 9.5, right? But what the comments are like, should we go borrow money, right? If I was you at this stage in, the, in your career, yeah, don't go use the 9.5, borrow money. Do you see how this 95% rule, you can take it to the next level that well? You don't have to go, you can really uh, expand your portfolio, increase more, have more properties, you know? Going back to what you were saying, your comments were we have to do with that again? Responsible for right. So let's determine first. If you ask me if I'm more responsible to hire the to buy the property. The appraiser is the person who's going to come and value your building, who's hired by technically the excuse me. You're going to go apply for a loan. So that bank, that lending institution is going to hire an appraiser to go value the property. Right, because of what happened in the recession in 2007 and 8, the rules have changed where I can call my friend and say, Listen, go value my building and give me a high value of that property. Right? So, there's a lot of regulations that happened after 2008 where we brokers or agents or investors are not hiring that appraisal. The lending institution have to go through a clearinghouse, a third party that works with them and they send that appraisal. And sometimes you may have an appraisal, who, let's say the property is uh, in San Francisco, and then you have to find somebody maybe from the South Bay area. Here. They don't know anything about that area. But see, this is one way that the, the market is, is, is getting uh, in a way healthy because generally speaking, the value. Hopefully, uh, 
it is not subjective, it's very objective. I can give you good and bad comments about that, but the big picture here is that, yeah, you don't have a lot of pressure as far as the, it's the lending institution is a higher level. Isn't it difficult to disclose the one company? Oh my God, you know what? See what you said right now? Now, now, now we're getting into the analysis very deep, right? We got 10 buildings to close escrow, right? Yeah. How long do we need to close escrow? How, in how many days? Six months, 180 days. Six months come fast. You got 10 transactions going on, right? So the answer to the question is, if I am the broker or the investor, the answer is 100% yes, right? You're not gonna be, because this is, your livelihood, or perhaps this is your livelihood for your future, meaning that you want to have that passive income to make sure that you know that everything goes smooth. So the answer to your question is, yeah, you can do it. You know, this is where you can uh, what's the word? Uh, filter, filter those investors who don't want to build or want to engage in the process. Do you see how you can increase the wealth if you have that mindset that you have? You can stay here or go on, the, on this side. If you say, no, 180 days is, is to shoot too short, I'm not gonna do that. But then if you, if you have value, if you give value to those seven benefits, you say 180 days, a piece of cake. I'll do it in three, four months. I have done it in less than three months. By the way, going back to that example I just gave you, within three months, I closed that deal that I found the that I told you about. And the two replacement property, I close escrow in 30 days, like two days apart on the replacement property. So my mindset was like 180 days. No, no, I'm gonna do it quicker than that. So, so the answer to the question, yeah, you can do that. Okay, let's continue. Has someone asked that yeah. question? Yeah. Said, wait, so could your client have raised 7.45 more million after he sold the relinquished property and purchased the building? Because he would have 9.5 million in total. And since he has a 95%, he could disregard the That's right. Yeah, you have to go. The answer is like everybody online who's asking those questions are very advanced and they're right. You know, they don't have to go with the 200% rule, they can go with the 95% rule because we're, we're talking about large numbers, you know? So the answer is yeah, you can do that because there's no, remember, there's no limit. Any number of properties, you know. So that's when you're talking about high numbers, that's where the 95% rule comes in. Excellent question, Anna. Yeah. Okay, this is a case study. This uh, we're gonna go to this case study. This is a transaction also I just completed, and this is like uh, we're gonna go into details about uh this building that I sold and what my client did. So let's take a five minute break and then we'll resume, is that okay? All right, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> but you are, man. <laughs> so today is your last class? Yeah, for you, like for the Friday. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to that. I love it. It's great. I wish you didn't know. How many glasses are you taking this thing? Four? Yeah. Four. 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 Oh, nice. That's great. Yeah, taking five classes is a whole world. Yeah. 
Yeah. So next next semester is uh, your last semester. No, I have uh, next spring. So it won't be left. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I have a whole other year. Oh, yeah. 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 And how about you? Take the part now. Four track. Second year, third year. Oh, sorry. Top one. Nice. So there's a. Uh, I did a. Uh, mini presentation on uh, on F31 last year. So two weeks ago, I went to Dr. Song's class. Real estate investment. Have you guys taken that one? No. Good job. Very good. Also, the uh, the real estate development class for Mark Masuda. You can check out the classes there. Well, I highly recommend you guys do it. No, uh, I think that's all the requirements there. I think it's just like the fundamental for finance. That's it. Oh, really? It won't stick by your point. Right? Oh, really? So, I don't know. I'm, I'm just like the entrepreneurship major. I think I'm going to take fundamental finance next semester. Yeah. I don't take any intro class, but after that. I mean, I'm a finance major, so that's what it says for me. I don't know if it's different for you. It might be different. Um, what, for the other guy, that's not for the other guy. For both, it was oh, the same for, for me. Yeah, they oh, just, okay. once you take the fundamentals class, they're good. Okay, so for me, have you taken that one? Okay. I, I didn't take it last year. Yeah, just take that one and uh, have you taken that one? Not yet. Not yet. And then that will give, give you an open ability to take those two classes. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are excellent. I'm telling you, those excellent classes are excellent. I'm pretty sure that we can um, just do some more as well. I don't know how to make it into the session because I guess we can do it about the same time. But Oh, that's great. That yeah. awesome. You have to uh, have permission? Yeah, so you have to, you have, my guy is in the scout event, so I have to just talk to him. Say, yeah. Okay, and then if you do that, then uh, you save yourself in a semester. Yeah. yeah. Right? So you have to like, wait for that semester. Yeah. Actually, not a few. I highly recommend guys, I encourage you to take those two classes and take that route because then you can see things in a different perspective when you're taking those classes, you know? You start thinking about, or oh, this type of investment I can do at one. You know? right. That's how I can right. expand my portfolio, or on the development plans, right? Yeah. To see are you gonna be wasting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, we can go. We'll take a second break. Okay. Yeah. So oh, yeah, I'm listening. I'm just making sure you don't need water. Or anything. Well, I'm. I'm excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Woo. I I feel. How long? Yeah. Oh, good, right? I don't attention. <laughs> okay, let's uh, uh let's resume uh before we get to the case study. Uh let's uh let's do the polling, you know. Uh can you guys get online to see if you can get that uh those questions? I sent eight questions online and uh let's see if you can yeah, the QR code. Yeah. Can we do the polling? Uh, yeah. Can they do it uh, here in the class? Oh, yeah. I think it's uh, but it's it's okay. I I have uh, I have it. Like the questions we're gonna get. No, no, this no, is just a point we're going to do based on what we have learned so far. Okay. You know, yeah. He launched the poll online. You did already? For the people on Zoom. Okay. For, in the class. For this class, I, I can do it from here. I'm mm -hmm. going to go. Can they, can they see it here from the computer? From the computer? Those uh, people online, they can already see the poll. They can already see yeah, the poll. Okay, I don't think we can activate it. Let's just zoom in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's on. Oh. So I'm sharing the slides for you on my computer. Okay, that's right. Do that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 
You want to share? Yeah. Uh, share it like your slide on like data. Okay. I think you did the QR code for the for the first for, uh, the, for the point for the point. Uh, the QR code is for that. Uh, okay, got it. Yeah. What I We can do that. What I do the case study, and then and then now we can figure that out. Okay. Oh, he's coming. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's what we need. Yeah, yeah, this one, right? yeah. you put it uh, on the screen. Yeah, that's the same. Uh, I'm just sure. We just need the question. It's like the color screen Yeah, he wants to just put it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, let's uh, let's start. Uh, let's have fun with these questions here. This is going to be uh, applicable, real life uh, questions that I get asked on a daily basis, or weekly basis at the office. You know, so. Uh, Let's do the first one. Uh, we have to take a polling as well online and uh, see if I said yes or no answer. Um, can, let's do the honors. You read the first one, the first question. So basically what it is is that you, when you purchase that property, you put it in a trust, you know? So the replacement property is going to be purchased under your husband or, or husband and wife's name. So on the trust, replace the relinquished property, in replacement property, which is going to be under the husband and wife's name. So can you do that, right? Can you sell under the trust name and buy the replacement property under your name? Can you do that? That's very simple, right? So let's take the poll right now. Uh, what we can do here, we can not just raise our hands to see yes or no. Okay, so trust, and then we're gonna sell it, that relinquished property and purchase two unit building, triplex, 10 units under your name, your husband and wife's name. So can you do that? Who says yes, that we can do that? Who says no? How about online? So here in the class, 95% of you said, no, you cannot do that. And 5% said, yes, you can do that. How about online? What's the percentage? What's the percentage? No problem. So, okay, 36% said yes, 64% said yes. Okay, kind of online, it's like 36% say yes. So you're in the 36% and then? 64% said 64% said no. You guys, so almost the same online versus on class in person. So the answer is, Yes, you can do that. The reason why there are, this answer can be explained to you in so many ways, but I'm going to just uh, filter and polish it, just uh, condense it into just something simple. When you have a trust, the trustee is, they use your social security number. When you buy the replacement property, husband and wife, you use your social security number. So it's all about the tax ID number or social security number. So that's why you can do that. Because when you sold that trust, then you can buy it under your, your wife and your husband's name. And we're gonna get into more questions that tells you all the variances of that answer because sometimes you can have a trust and you have its own entity, right? So you have a trust that can be a LLC, Corporation C, Corporation S, Limited Liability Corporation, or Limited Partnership. Right? And by the way, I just wanna tell you that everybody online that at least 85, 90% of transactions of investors who want to set up an entity, they use an LLC, 85%, because that gives them an extra layer of protection. So most of like, remember that 95% uh, rule, they have a portfolio property, 
all those clients, they use an L, most of those clients are LC. Right. So everything that you can talk about, like, Yeah. Does that apply for LLCs and individuals? Exactly right. Everything we talked about right now, right now, we're getting to like real life stuff right now, you know, like, like let's ask those questions, let's talk about it in detail. So, yeah, so if you have an LLC, now that entity has its own entity, its own tax ID number, right? It's going to be different than the wife and husband social security, right? Now, so that's what you guys probably, most of you guys are thinking online as well. You cannot do it, right? But I want to tell you why most of the clients, they don't take that route because when you go to the bank and apply for a loan, most lending institutions, most lending institutions will not allow you to borrow money under a trust. They want to have your social security number, your identification. So that's the reason why most clients, when they apply for a loan, it's under the social, social security number. It is, there's always an uh, exception to the rules, but the answer to this question is that you can do that. You can make it very simple, you know? Like if you have a revocable trust, irrevocable trust, it's under your, your tax, your social security number, then you can buy the replacement property under your, your name. So that's the connection. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, question. Yes. Yeah. Isn't it better to always have other people under like a an, an different entity? Yeah. For example, like an LLC. So if, if if I go to the bank and they ask me for my social security number, etc., how do I am I am I able to use that proper key to a different uh, entity after or not? Remember that the simple answer is that they will not. Right. The bank don't want you to apply under the trust name. Right. You know, and it's because of you know they they want to make sure that you have enough collateral on your your name. You know that. Remember my example that I gave you when I pushed in my office building. When I pushed in my office building, it was kind of in reverse. I applied my name, right? I, but I, I opened my entity for my my workers' company, Operation C. So they use that corporation, that entity, that tax ID number as a collateral. But, but the building, the building that I purchased, that's right. It's not, it was not under the corporation C. If you follow what I just said right now, you guys are you guys very clear. You guys are gonna be very clear on that. Yeah. Um, can you hear temporary one by replacements and family, but not people? Like, can family members buy houses free from different scenarios? You know, I, I love that you asked me that question. By the way, because that's one of the questions coming up. Oh, but I'm gonna do no, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna just get into it. So he's asking if he can do a 1031 exchange with family members, you know. So I'm gonna give you the hint lineage, lineage of the family. Keep up, what's lineage of the family, right? So in the family tree, right? Grandma, grandpa. Who's next? Mom, dad. Who's next? Daughter, son, that who's next? Their kids, right? How about cousin? Is that part of the lineage? <clears throat> How about second cousin? <clears throat> Has to be same family. And we're gonna get into more details. Questions coming up, but excellent observation that you're making. Right now. Let's go to the next one. Okay, can investors go their own way, separate ways in an exchange when title is in partnership, LLC, or tenants in common? Right? This one is fun. This, this would, if you follow this one, oh my God, we're going to be two steps ahead. Right? So now, remember, we said that we bought the property under LLC. That we relinquished property, we sold it. Now we have to buy a replacement property, right? It says separate way in exchange with Travis partnership, LLC, or tenants in common. 
So let's say we got that 2 million fifty. Let's try an example. We close that because it was in a, in a LLC, right? Let's say you, I, all of us here in the class in online, right? But then we'll agree and say, you know what, guys, let's go our own way, our separate ways. We made money, let's dissolve what we have. No, nothing personal, it's just business, right? So the answer is, right? Can investors go their own separate ways? Yes, as long as you wait 24 in the future. It's called today, they buy that replacement property, still gonna buy it under the, uh, the partnership, right? But in escrow, when you close escrow today, when you reach the 180 days, you have an agreement. You will see an attorney, someone who practice real estate law, you know, some on somebody online or students online who are going to law school, you know, this is a, another career that you can uh, you can pursue. You write up that agreement that in two years, all of us and everybody online will agree, let's go our separate way, they cut each other's equal payments and, and go our separate ways. So the answer to that question is yes, you can do that. 24 months after. The reason why it's not like a year after or a month later is because the intent, it was the intent, everybody online intent, the intent that you were going to be doing at 1031. Because if you go your separate way when you close escrow, you have cash access to the cash, right? So you don't need an accommodator, right? So, so that's the intent. You have the intent to do a 1031 exchange. That's why you have to wait for 24 months. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, what, what's the uh, percentage online, by the way, who say yes or no? 29% uh, said yes, 71%. Okay, so online, 29 uh, said what? Uh, yes. Say yes. 71% said yes. Okay, so online, 29 said yes. Okay, so said yes. Okay, so okay, so it's the opposite, right? So all of you guys uh, understand that one. Okay, let's go to the third one. Let's do the polling on the third one. When investors sell their relinquished property and buy a replacement property, can they hold back cash from the sale for capital improvement or the replacement property? So you're selling the property to the relinquished property today, but you wanna keep some money back for capital improvements and then and then you buy that replacement property. Can you hold some cash, you know? So who says yes? So 90% of you said yes. 10% say yes and 90% said no, right? Who says no? Most of you guys said no. How about online? 68% said yes and 32% said no. Okay, so mostly yes, right? And right here in class is mostly yes, most of you guys? Mostly no. Who say yes? Okay, got it. So link of property, right? If you hold money, question, you have access to the cash? On this answer that the question is asking you, you can hold back money, right? So that means that you, you're gonna access the cash. So you cannot do that. Because if you access even one penny from that transaction, you have to pay capital gains. Yeah. Remember, the accommodator, this is good observation, right? This is why you're going to hire the accommodator so you don't touch that cash. So that this question was like a trick question, you know, because you, you can still do it, right? But if you call the accommodator to send you the money, or send me 50,000 so I can do some, some improvement. Or maybe I can just pay off my, my car. Or I want to go take a trip, right? Remember, if you have access to that cash, then you pay capital gains. Yeah, question? Someone asked, so you wouldn't pay taxes only on the amount you access of the proprietor check or your proprietor account? Keep, keep this in mind, right? That you are going to do a 1031 exchange. So whatever access to cash you have, you know, then you have to pay capital gains. So the answer is yes, online. 
they have like, and that's another strategy that you can do, by the way. It's not that it's something good or bad, it's that how much capital gains you want to pay at that time, right? So the answer to this question, you cannot do that if you want to do a complete 1031 exchange, right? So let's go to the next one. Can investors pay off other loans on a personal property that they own? Actually, I just gave you uh, an example right now, but uh, can investors pay off other loans on a personal property that they own? Explain to me about that question, if you don't mind. What does that mean? Yeah, so that could be like if they have a car lease um, and they're asking that you take out money from the, uh, the third party partner to pay that off. If the answer is yes, then you have to take out take out more than you would to pay it off because you're gonna have to pay the taxes. You have to pay taxes on that, yeah. All right, what's that for? 53% says yes, 40 seconds. So, so it's almost even, you know? So can okay, investor pay off? If you want, if you want to do a 10 to one exchange, remember you have to sign that exchange agreement and the agreement when you sign is that you, the objective of the 10 to one exchange is, not, is to defer the taxes, right? So those are the exceptions to the rules that we're talking about right now, like you want to keep 50 grand, 100 grand, but that's just a small percentage. Generally speaking, the answer is no, because you want to move all that proceeds, sales proceeds into the replacement property. Yeah. Is there a case where all of our sales don't go to the new uh, overview? You can give like 700 grand and down payment and then make some spare cash that the owner still has. Is, is there a case where that happens? I, I, I want to I speak from experience <clears throat> and everybody online. The question is that, is there a case when that happens when you have access to the cash and just use the, the sales proceeds just to uh, purchase a replacement property and you're using, let's say, 75, 80% of the sales proceeds and the balance and you keep yourself? The answer to the question is, yeah, you can do that, right? You, you can pay capital gain, but that's defeating the purpose, right? The, the idea of the 1031 is to protect that sales proceeds, right? Right now we've been talking about uh, the loopholes, the, uh, the small percentages, you know, but generally speaking, they don't do that. My clients, maybe one out of uh, 20 have done that, maybe 30 have done that, less than 5% in the past 10 years. So it doesn't happen too often because it is, it's that's why you do a thing to one thing. So you, you use the sales proceeds so you can buy that replacement property in full. So you can take advantage of leveraging and, and, and increase your portfolio. Good comment. Let's go to the next one. Can an investor sell to a related party or, or buy from a related party? Is it like what you're talking about? Okay, let's let's talk about that one, right? Give me a scenario now on that uh, question. Can an investor sell to a related party or buy from a related party? Let's say you and your mom, your brother, your sister, you buy this property like five years ago, right? And then uh, you want to do a venture one exchange. So can the seller, Sell to a related party. Oh, you know, I want to sell it to my, my sister, this property that I'm selling. So it stays in the family. Can I do that? Who says yes? Hmm. Who says no? Okay, so uh, 45, 55, okay. Yeah, 59% say yes and 41 say no. Okay. You always have to be two steps ahead of the fundamentals. I'm not sure that you don't make mistakes in this type of transaction, this type of uh, 1031 exchange transaction, you know? In the past, can you imagine the past like 50, 60 years since the starter case? They have so many family members have thought about this. I'm gonna sell it to my brother, my sister, you know, my mom, my dad, stay in the family, you know? You cannot do that. As long you can do it, it's an exception to the rule. Only if 
that owner of the person property, who is your mom and sister or brother, is also doing a 1031. That will be the only case. So both parties who are family members are doing also a 1031 exchange. But if you just want to give it to your mom, your sister, your brother, you cannot do that. Because it's family lineage. If it's connected directly, right, directly to your family, then you cannot do that. Yeah. Um, can my brother do a 1031 exchange on the property in my investment? Can your brother who owns uh, an investment property and he is going to, and you live in the investment property, and then your brother is going to sell that investment property, that relinquished property. Buy another one. And buy that replacement property. That and you move into that one, right? Who is purchasing that replacement property? Right, so the answer is, in that scenario, yeah, you can do that because your brother owns that relinquished property, gives the money to the accommodator, the accommodator is going to purchase that replacement property. From a non-related that's right, from non related property. That's right, that's right. And then basically, you're going to rent it out, and he's going to help you out so you can maybe manage the property for your brother or just live in the property. Yeah, so the answer, yeah, you can do that. It's a, it's a unrelated property. Yeah. Yes, what about the spouse? Yeah, so it, it then is so the answer is you cannot do that if it's a family member, like a spouse or a husband, you know, and, unless that spouse. Is also doing a 1031 exchange. But if, if that spouse who owns that replacement property is not doing a 1031 exchange, you cannot do that. Yeah. But you can do it with a cousin, right? Or someone. Oh, you got it. Now you're thinking, right? Lineage, right? Who, who's, not in, who's not part of the lineage of the family? Cousins, uncles. Who else? Second cousins. The friends of the cousins, right? So it's not part of the lineage. Good observation there. Okay, let's go to the next one. Can the seller of the replacement property carry back a loan for the buyer? Have you heard have you guys heard that before about carrying back a loan? Basically, what that is is that I'm selling the relinquished property. And I found someone who's gonna sell me that property. Right? I'm going to let them borrow some money for the down payment off of my sales proceeds. Okay? Can the seller of the replacement property carry back a loan? In other words, you're going to lend money to that buyer, right? Lend money. Can you do that? And I'll give you guys a hint online as well. Do we have access to the, the cash, the negotiation, the term? Yes or no? Right? So if you have access to the cash, do you trigger capital gains or not? Right? So keep that in mind. Okay? Let's do the polling. Can the seller of the replacement property carry back a loan? So you sell the property, you're gonna lend some money to that buyer. You're gonna lend some money to the buyer. Can you do that? Yes? Maybe. So I'm sorry, I'm confused with the question. So the person we're buying it from, are they going to be able to give the loan to us? The other way around. The other way around. Yeah, the other way around. We have all this money, right? We've been making, yeah, right? But you know, we're gonna help that buyer, right? Here, you know what? I think I'll lose some money. It's like the, totally, the idea is totally the opposite of what we're talking about. We're trying to defer taxes, right? Defer capital gains. So the answer to the question is that can the seller of the replacement probably carry back a loan for the buyer online? What's the, the fault? 59 say yes and 41 say yes. Okay, the one who said no, good as to you, can the server refer to the back and one? No, you can't. So that's good online. Excellent. Because you have access to the cash. And even let's get into more detail, right? When you are going to lend money to someone, right? 
you're gonna set up terms and conditions, no? You're gonna set up like a, a regular loan, right? Time period, interest rate, monthly payments. So you as the owner of that money, right? That you're gonna be giving to that person, have control of the terms. So you have access to the terms, you have access to the cash, that will trade your capital gains. <clears throat> Okay. Next, can the seller obtain a line of credit, equity line? Yeah. This might be a, it's not really. Good. No, 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 it's okay. Um, is there any location restriction on ten thirty one? Like, can you buy in Alaska, sell in Alaska, buy in Florida? I said U.S. Congress, right? Yeah. Remember, they, this rule has been going on since for over a hundred years. Yeah. In what nineteen? What was nineteen seventy nine? The Starker case. This this is for the whole United everywhere, the U.S. As long as you follow this rule, of course, every state has uh, their own uh, separate forms that you need to follow. You know, but the concept stays the same. Okay, so I just want to know if you, uh, how many of you know what's a HELOC of a uh, home equity line? How many of you guys know? Do you, do you, online? Uh, Seven, said yes. So online they said yes, that you can do that for HELOC and 30% said no? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's clarify what is a HELOC. What's a HELOC? Yeah, so when you own equity in a house, let's say you own, I don't know, one five hundred thousand of a house that costs you a million. That's fifty percent. Um, you can then go to your financer, usually a bank, and say, "Hey, I have fifty percent equity in the house. Can I take out some credit based on the equity that I have?" And then you can use that credit to buy another house. Right. So basically, we're gonna uh, take it one step further, right? To give the example, your example there that you own a property that have rentals, people that own in your property. This one here that you have uh, some properties, some houses that you own, in the back that you have some condos and townhouses, you know, you have a, a hundred unit building, 50 unit building, 20 unit building, right? So you can pull a HELOC, right? That's what we're talking about, HELOC here. HELOC meaning that because cap rate compression, right? Remember, cap rates went down. What happened to uh, the value of the property? Up, right? It's in inverse correlation, negative correlation, right? Going up, so all that equity, I call that dormant equity. It's been asleep, right? All these years, right? Appreciating. So one day you decided to let's get a home equity loan. Let's get a another trustee. Let's pull money. Let's pull that equity out. You know, from from all that appreciation that that you have on your property, all that equity that you earn and that. That build that property you have right now, let's say about two years ago, it was worth $800,000, now it's 1.6. You wanna put money out. So you can say you don't wanna do a 1031, you just wanna do a HELOC, right? Get another trustee, another loan, put money out. That's what it's a HELOC is all about. Right? So going back to the question, is everybody on the same wavelength? Okay, great. Can the seller obtain a line of credit? That means that. You gotta go and borrow money against that property, right? So now you borrow the money, and now you're ready to do a 1031 exchange, right? This, by the way, this question is all connected to 1031 exchanges to do that, that exchange. Can you do that? Yes or no? Yes? No? Online? Okay, so basically, can the sellers obtain line of credit? You cannot do that. Because why? You have access to that cash. You have access to that loan. So let's say today, right? You did a HELOC today. Then tomorrow, you're going to sell that property and do a 10 to one exchange, right? The intent was for you to do a 1031 exchange, but it doesn't reflect 
because you, in the eyes of the IRS, you took advantage of the system, right? In other words, you are going to pull money out before you, you list the property for sale. So you cannot do that. You cannot do that. You can do it like two years before. There's always that time period. Always keep that in mind. Like whatever decision you make, do it at least like 24 months before. Two years prior, you could do it. There's no intent in the future, right? That you do it in three months. So does the line of credit have to be fully paid off before you do the 1031, or is it just based on the function of time? The 1031 exchange is the function of time because the intent was to do a 1031 exchange. So if you are going to pull the money out today and sell it in the future, just make sure that you wait at least two years in the future. So even if I still have an outstanding balance, so I can still do that, that. balance is relevant. It's more about activating that equity line. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, sorry. Even though like the line of credit is still being paid off, like the EVA is still being paid off. Yeah. So it's 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 the function of time, like you said right now. Right? It's, it's when you are going to apply for that loan, because if you usually fill out the like, like revolving account, they open a, a line, start the line of credit, and you get the money. To you, you know. Yeah. Uh, so what's the polling online for this is question seven, right? Yeah. This is 73, and 70 said yes. Okay, the 30 people who said, 30 percent said no, they're right. <laughs> this, this question here is the one that I get asked, um, at least like every week, by the way, this, this is like every week. I think I, we talked about this, you know, this one here, you know? Okay, you're in the middle, can you read, if you don't mind? Yeah. The seller who presents this property presents it with an empty identifier that is distinct from seller. Okay, can the seller relinquish property, move into a replacement property as a primary residence, right? It's like pretty simple, right? Let's say, for instance, you, you said to yourself, you know what, I'm gonna buy that investment property and then I'm gonna sell it, relinquish the property, and then buy my replacement property, but I'm gonna live in that property. Can you do that? Who says no? Okay. 39 said yes, 61 said Okay. People who said no, that's the answer. Because remember in the beginning, uh, there were four type of properties you cannot do a 1031 exchange. Got it. He said that you sell the relinquish property, your investment property, and then buy the replacement property as an investment. But wait two years and then I move in. Yeah, you can do that. That's a strategy right there. Right? Can you do it before the two years? No, right? Because it's primary residence, right? So excellent. Your observation is excellent. Yeah. That one more question. Yeah. So yeah, the primary residence, second home, all that, that's not eligible for a 1031. My question is, can you use it like on the front end? So like we are exchanging my private, my old primary residence to get a building. So, yeah. so the relinquished property, right? The relinquished property was your primary residence. That's what you're saying, right? So, okay. uh, so keep, uh, let's follow your train of thought, right? So you have your relinquished property that is your primary residence, and then you are going to Give the money to an accommodator, and the accommodator is going to take that money from your primary residence. That sales proceeds is going to buy a replacement property. Yeah, right? that's not going to be the primary residence. It's just and that's going to be an investment property. Yeah. You just identify another strategy because in California, there are exceptions of ownership when it's primary residence. Remember that the one that you sold was that an investment? The one that the this property at the beginning, it was not an investment because you live in it, right? It was primary residence. So all those rules that we talk about doesn't apply at all, totally, hundred percent. But there's 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 an exception that uh, the, the gardener 
and uh, the rules, the, IR, the IRS rules gives you to have an exemption. So you can put uh, up to 250,000 if it's single, up to 500,000 if it's couple, two people. And it depends on your uh, your tax bracket, you know, that they give you those exceptions. So you don't have to worry about the capital gain because they, you can get uh, benefits from as a primary resident. So that's one strategy that let's say it happens sometimes, you know, oh, you know, I live in the primary residence. I don't need that primary residence anymore for whatever reason. Now I want to buy an investment property. And you can do that. Technically, like if uh, a corporation, um, if you own a corporation uh, and then you bought property, um, couldn't you just technically live there and get a corporation that you own rent and you just travel? Yeah, I mean, yeah. so you just try to rent out like a duplicate fragment, maybe you live in one unit and rent out the other ones, or it can be a hundred unit building. Even if it's like a single family house, like if the corporation is. The answer is yes. I mean, they, right now we just identified like three strategies. Can you imagine? This is beautiful right now. We're, we're, we're like uh, formulating strategies right now, right? Like you said, about that. if you want to leave, let's say if you want to buy an investment property, you should be obsessed on, on private residence or the other way around. You know, you want to, and you have an investment and you, you know, appreciate it so much that now you have all this money and then you have this dream house that you want to leave by the beach, at the mountains, or in a nice neighborhood, but it's a house that's so expensive, but then that was a strategy in the future, you know, to buy that primary residence, but you have to wait two years. That's another strategy, right? You'll find the, buy the replacement property, but wait two years to move in, right? And do the strategy of what you said right now, right? You can invest in investment, right? So when you first property is an investment, you be the accommodator, the accommodator's gonna buy another investment property, you know, and so, uh, LLC, LLC, corporation entity. And so you can live in the property as a tenant, right? So that means that you have to report that income, that cash flow. So you're going to become a tenant of that building. Of course, you can, uh, it's your property, right? right? You know, but uh, you have to understand something, right? That it's so important that you cannot live in two places, generally speaking. Right? So you have to determine what's an investment and what's primary residence. So in your scenario, you have to establish, right? So you don't want to cut yourself short. Right? So, so you live in that property or the investment property. But then when you do your tax return, right? You have to say which is your primary residence and which is your investment. You cannot well, it's only one. So it's up to you to make that decision. My recommendation, don't do that because they, it raises too many red flags. But look, what's, what's on the bottom part? What does it read on the bottom part? In the back. Can you read what it says? On, yeah. Yeah. Any exceptions to what we're talking about right now? So the answer right now, what's the answer online? Right? So they're right, right? You cannot do that. All of us, we agree, right? We cannot do that. But look, it's an exception. What's the exception? What happens in a lifetime in our family, some of us, friends, facts of life that happens? And that's where the exception comes in. The exception to the rule is if somebody passes away, somebody dies, it's an exception to the rule, or there's a divorce. It's what is called an unanticipated event. Unanticipated event online. Unanticipated events. So any event, so think about this right for a moment. An event that is not anticipated, that you didn't plan. Give me an example, an event. Two examples, I just gave you two examples. What's the first one I gave you right now? Death, right? Online, death, you know, an exception to the rule. And the second one I gave you? 
Good Lord. Okay. Can you think of something else unanticipated? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Right. No. And that's connected to death, perhaps, unfortunately, right? So there you go. Give me another one. What's happening now in, uh, unfortunately, in Russia and in Ukraine? That war, right? So unanticipated events. Something that is unanticipated. That's going to be bigger than, it can be a hurricane, you know, but something that is not planned. That will be the exception to the world. So right now, let's spend uh, the last, 10 minutes or less. Uh, I wish I can talk to you guys more, you know? And I don't wanna take a break because we're almost done. Uh, so interrupt me. If you have questions right now, you can ask in online as well. But this is a case study. Uh, uh, let's see here if I can pull it out real quick. This is a transaction I just did last year, by the way. Uh, a family who own a building in Westchester down the street from LNU. And uh, I represent the seller on this one. And basically, this is what they did. They sold this building, four unit property, it was 1.5 million. And look how much the loan was on this property. This property was a 240,000 loan. They were paying six and a half percent. And their cap rate was 4.75. How much did I sell this property for? 1.550. Okay, so the loan balance and the cost after paying off all the expenses on this transaction, my client had left 1.186. So he had 1,186,000 sales proceeds ready to go. So this is what I, I, this is how I structured this deal for him. He purchased four units in Los Alamitos for 1.2. He put a down payment of 480,000 and his cap rate went up to 5.5. So now he's getting a better units. He has two bedrooms, four two bedrooms in this building. And then he purchased the second property, three, a triplex in, uh, in San Pedro. So he purchased this other property in San Pedro at 1.1. So his down payment was seven seven hundred and six thousand. So as a result of this transaction, he went ahead and had better location, newer buildings, more units, better mix. He improved his cash flow, more fair market market value, and he has cheaper debt. So that's what he did right now. He the one point one eight six. He went ahead and purchased these two properties. Quick question, if you were the broker on this transaction, would you put that much down payment? How would you make it different? This is the way that I allocate it. And there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. I just wanna see, I just want you guys to get, and by the way, this is a spreadsheet that uh, you can plug in numbers uh, in red, and it changes. It's, it's a whole model that I have in the next three, four pages, by the way. But it begins from here. So this property, they purchased one at 1.2, 1.1, and they put a down payment of 480,000 and 706. Is this a good idea, 40 and 60 percent? We do 50-50, 20, 80. What do you think? So based, yeah. It would depend on how much the value of the properties are. If you want to have, it just depends on if you want to have higher cash flow, if you want to have uh, greater, uh, that's right. And by the way, right now, what he's saying, he's talking about financial engineering. Remember, we talked about those three pillars in the beginning. This is where your finance background comes in, your analysis comes in, that you can evaluate. You're right, what you're saying. This is why this model that I created here is beautiful, because it, it, it helps you analyze that, you know? This one. Four units, so they buy four more, three, seven units more. Your GI, look how much 79,000, 70, almost 80,000 was getting for GI. His NOI was 73,000 approximately. The two replacement property, now he increases cash flow. 
64 here, 59 here. He improved his cash flow. He went ahead and his wealth went up. 1.550 he sold. He bought two properties, 1.2, 1.1. 1 .1. His fair market value went up. His cap rate. Look what happened to the cap rate. From 4.75, he went up to 5.3 and 5.4. Split the debt. So he went ahead and replacement property, 720, 394. So this is how much money he borrowed. 1.114 more debt. So he has more debt. What happened to his cash flow? He went up. So this is one way that you can leverage. So this is beautiful right here. You can just put the numbers, start playing with the numbers to see what's the effect and start evaluating all these different properties, different areas. You know? So this transaction, he met the requirement of the 200% yield. 1.550. He can buy up to 35, 31, 3 million 100, right? He purchased 2.3. Okay. He could have borrowed more money, by the way. You can see that. You can, he was he was very conservative in this decision, by, by the way. But he did here. He can he can really go up on, on the debt. Okay, bro. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> and this is the uh, calculation for the depreciation here. Uh, it shows that 27.5 years straight line depreciation. And basically, after you do all the calculations here, you know, with his long term capital gain 626. If he would have sold the property and not do a replacement property, he has to pay 62% of this money here. You know, on capital gains. By the way, uh, would you have borrow more money and buy another property on this one, or not? What do you think? Why? Why you would have done that? That's right. Yeah, so he would have uh, purchased online another property because he has enough cash. He had plenty of, he put more than, what was it, like 60% of that one? That's a lot of down payment, right? He can just use maybe a split that 60% to 30 and 30 and buy another building. Good. So, see, this is one way that you can uh, really uh, diversify or increase your portfolio, have more properties, you know? But this is wonderful. If you can follow uh, this model and, and understand all these seven benefits of doing the 1031 exchange, you know, you will empower yourself and also your investors. So do you see here that uh, the four taxes here? This is how you would have, if you don't do a 1031 exchange, check it out how much you would have paid. Almost 300,000 in cash. You know. So basically, you are going to be saving more than 154,000 on your capital gains and your recapture uh, depreciation. So look at the seven benefits here, you know? Can you tell me before we go in the next couple of minutes, we're gonna be uh, almost uh, complete with the, uh, the session, but it's just, I'm just uh, curious to see and I always like to get a feel of your perspective or of risk appetite. These seven benefits uh, that we've talked about, which one do you think is most important? No right or wrong answer, I just wanna understand, you know? Um, if you, let's start from the back coming from the front. Let's uh, give me your top. Let's say that uh, the, the most priority that you think from the four, from the seven. 
Okay, let's go to uh, in the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have more units. Next. Okay. Okay. Next. Next. Cheaper debt. Next. Next. Cheaper debt. Next. Next. More for rocket body. Okay, next. Location, you said? Okay. Okay, next. Also more for rocket body. Okay. Next. For rocket body. Next. Cash flow. Anybody say cash flow here? This one? Next, online, anybody prefers from the seven benefits? So basically from the seven benefits, most of you guys said more units, cheaper debt, per market, per market value. What's amazing that location, <laughs> I understand this is important, right? But this represents most of people Answer in general speaking, I have like 50 people, 40 people in an audience, you know. More units. Actually, that's the answer, but that's one of the priority because if you have more units, everything's interrelated, right? More unit, more cash flow. More units, you may increase your debt, but then your cheaper debt. I mean, that's why you're gonna be having more debt, right? So you have a lesser interest rate on that debt, right? So that it is interrelated. It's amazing that location is important, but not as important. It, it, it's not amazing I mean, how, how is the industry is evolving. Location, location, location is good, but when it comes to internal wave change and investment, this type of uh, transactions, you have to weigh all the seven benefits, you know? And, Cheaper debt is X. Who said cheaper debt, by the way? What's in your mind on cheaper debt? Use somebody else's money, right? Somebody else's money to, build to build wealth. Exactly right. What are you going to say? That's correct. And who else is? Yeah, I just have to More units. And right now, with this, we're living in times. I mean, can you please more percent? It's going to take a little while to get to that 9% that I talked to you about. Perhaps not in the next five years, hopefully, but we'll see. But at least in the next two, three years, you know, even if they keep raising rates, it may not go more than like five, six, you know, which is still cheap. So, that cap rate compression term still going on, you know? Anyways, I, I wish I had more time to share with you. And um, if you can allow me. You guys gonna come and put up the QR code? Yeah, she's coming. Okay, this is my website, guys. Uh, please enjoy this for like a two minutes. Are we able to see here? Uh, yeah. So this is the dormant equity that we talked about, you know, that cap rate compression, properties are appreciating. So you're going to refer that 
and increase your cash flow. Why me, why now? Because you are a real estate investor. That's why you're gonna be doing that now. The interest rates are low. So here's the explanation like in, a, in baby terms about the 1031 exchange. Step one, you sell your current home, your current property, we call that relinquished property. Ding, ding, ding. The clocks are ticking. 45 days, 180 days to finish the transaction. You hire an accommodator. You hold the clocks on your behalf. <laughs> Meanwhile, you have 45 days to close the deal to identify the, the properties that we talked about, the three, pro, the three rules that we need to follow. Step three, you follow those identification rules we talked about, the three property rule, 200% rule, the 95% rule, and we have to close escrow in 180 days. These are the rules here. The proper rule, 200% rule, 95% rule. So the accommodator is going to purchase the property on your behalf within 180 days. So anyways, that's what I want to share with you this uh, slide, uh, this video. Before I go, do you have any uh, final comments? Uh, if you wanna reach out, you can come talk to me after the class. I give you my business card, but those are the uh, three questions that uh, we're gonna ask you to answer. And I think that's uh, basically uh, too many times, you know? The three, pro the three replacement property rules, remember? And what's the role of the accommodator? And what are the benefits of it? Of doing a 1031 exchange? We talk about the seven benefits. So you can list maybe one or two. If you want to list them all, that's fine. 